Hi, I'm Dr. Shama Manathan, and in this video, I'm going to talk about um, the whole phenomena of Gurus uh, and the Lord Ishra. And uh, the word Guru just means teacher, but um, uh, it's an Indian word. Sanskrit, it comes from Sanskrit, and certainly in Sanskrit and, and Indian languages, being a guru is just kind of a normal, it's just, it's just a word that you could use for a teacher. But uh, kind of by the Western reception of uh, yoga uh, and, you know, spirituality and things like that, uh, the word guru has come to mean something kind of, uh, you know, different from simply a teacher to a kind of leader who uh, is understood as kind of exceptional or special in some way, and uh, and you're and and they are treated as though they are somehow the only means of knowledge with respect to a topic, right? So, I mean, if you, if I have a teacher who teaches me how to drive, I don't think that you know, she or he's the only person I can learn how to drive from. But the moment we start talking about gurus, right, or we start to think about this kind of guru phenomena, right, we think about them, and I'm talking about in the westernized context, as kind of individuals who are given this exceptional status, as though there's, you couldn't learn that from anyone else, right? So if they're yoga teachers or meditation gurus, right, they're treated as though they have some kind of special knowledge and you couldn't acquire that any other way. Okay, which is kind of weird because if uh, we're talking about knowledge, right? Knowledge is about things in the world. It's not about us as as knowers. And so when we when we're interested in knowledge, we should be interested in people who are help, going to help us ourselves become knowledgeable, not people who we always treat as somehow having knowledge that we couldn't figure out on our own, or you know. Uh, or some other way, because then if we start to think about it that way, we treat ourselves as individuals who could never really kind of come to that same position of knowledge, right? We always treat that individual as somehow kind of beyond the kind of uh, expertise uh, uh, or competence that we could we could uh, we could come to, right? So this brings me to the Yoga Sutra. And this brings me to the Yoga Sutra because Ishra, uh, sorry, it potentially only talks about one teacher, uh, and that's Ishra. So Ishra is the Lord, and uh, uh, potentially recommends meditating on the Lord more than once, and it seems to be the central practice of the Yoga Sutra, uh, and certainly kind of the, the theme, a theme that he, he comes back to more than once. Um, so the Lord is a, according to Patanjali, is a special person who's uh, who's untouched by past choices, karma, uh, and is also free of afflictions, free to move into the future, uh, not meeting any resistance to choosing. So uh, the Lord is someone who's gonna, at the, uh, on the one hand, not conservative, not stuck in the past, but also free to move forward. Uh, he says that uh, uh, within Ishra there's a seed of omniscience, and Ishra is unbound by time and was the first teacher. Okay, so the very possibility of knowledge, of learning, according to Patanjali, is Ishra. It's, you know, we never learnt, it would be impossible to come to know anything without, without Ishra, because Ishra is kind of the first teacher. So you might think, well, hold on, that's weird. Doesn't that sound just like this guru thing where we think that there's someone who's really special and, you know, knowledge is something about them. It's not about us. It's not something that we could figure out on our own. And aren't we setting ourselves up to give some weird deference to an authority figure who who we always look up to but somehow uncritically assume is perfect? And meanwhile, aren't we just making this up you know, isn't the idea of Ishra just kind of a figment of our imagination? Uh, and if we believe in it, then, you know, aren't we kind of suckers for, for telling us ourselves these stories? Okay, so I think Ishra is worth taking very seriously, and we should be devoted to Ishra. Um, but that's because 
being devoted to Ishra requires that you take responsibility for understanding lordliness. So to be devoted to Ishra on Patanjali's account is to come to understand Ishra. But whenever we understand something on the yoga account, we understand it because we're the ones who are underst are responsibly relating to the objects in question, right? So, you know, how is it that I come to understand the force of Niagara Falls, right? In order for me to understand the force of Niagara Falls, right, I have to relate responsibly to Niagara Falls so that I, you know, I appreciate the amount of water that's going through and the force of which it's coming through. And this requires me to do something, right, to adopt the appropriate uh, responsible relationship to that kind of awesome force of nature. But similarly, if I'm going to understand Ishra, right, I have to adopt the appropriate responsible relationship to lordliness, right? But how am I going to do that without taking responsibility for understanding what lordliness is? But then if to understand is to relate, then what ends up happening is that I end up relating myself to lordliness and this relation of lordliness means that I start to transform myself and I go from a person who didn't understand what it was to not be stuck in the past and to be free to move into the future to someone who is taking hold of that idea and in taking hold of that idea I start to transform my own life where I myself am increasingly the kind of person who's not stuck in the past and free to move forward, right? So why why is this kind of magical, uh, how does this kind of magic happen, you might say, right? Like, how is it that just kind of taking responsibility for understanding something changes me? You know, you might think of an analogy. This is an analogy I give my students all the time. I right? think about the analogy of the musician who's interested in learning music, right? So they want to be able to play music, and there's this activity that involves kind of doing something that makes music, but <clears throat> at first they're not good. They're not good at playing music. So what do they have to do? So they have to be devoted to the ideal of music. And then in being devoted to this ideal of music, they have a way to criticize their own behavior reflectively. But what ends up happening as they're devoted to this ideal of music is they start to practice this ideal imperfectly at first, albeit, but then after a while, right, what happens is that they start instantiating that ideal of music themselves, right? And so what was initially something very far away gets transformed into something that the musician is able to, to do themselves, right? So they become musical. And the great musicians, it's never like you come to a point, you're like, oh, there's no more ideal for me to think about, right? They're always pushing the boundaries of their performance and their 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 musical capacities because there's always this room to meditate further on the ideal of music and then use that as something that draws you in your practice right and so the ishra is like this it's the ideal of personhood and so at first we may not be very good at being people right but as we as we're devoted to this ideal and then we start to practice this ideal ourselves we start to transform ourselves into a person, into people who instantiate and display lordliness, right? So devotion to the Lord, then it's just like devotion to any, any practical ideal. But the thing about the Lord is the Lord is kind of this very basic ideal of personhood. What it is to be a person is to thrive when you're not stuck in the past and free to make new choices, right? That's when we're free. That's when we're happy. That's when we're when we're capable of moving forward in our lives. Uh, and, you know, and how do we get there except for by being devoted to this ideal and then practicing this ideal in our own life? So, while, you know, I do appreciate at first it sounds a, a little heavy handed that we should be devoted to the Lord, right? When you think about what this devotion means in the context of yoga, Right? It's extremely it's extremely liberating, right? We are supposed to take responsibility ourselves for practicing, for being for, for approximating this ideal. And approximating means that we end up displaying these characteristics ourselves. So given that that's what uh, you know 
yoga is a, you know is is geared towards helping us achieve it is very ironic that there are these people who set themselves up not as an ishra who inspires us to be lordly ourselves but people who set themselves up to kind of always you know be lordly and then we're kind of the backseat snivelers or something like that so uh you know there are lots of complicated historical explanations for how this phenomena comes about um but i think probably the simplest explanation is that people don't really get what yoga is right they don't really get what the point of yoga is they think of it as you know either like an exercise or something they you, know, you do for a half an hour a day or an hour a day <clears throat> or right they think about it as something that is passed down through some magical lineage and then you know you can be so lucky as to uh as to you know be part of that community i mean all of that's like a weird distraction that potentially doesn't talk about any of that uh in the yoga sutra right uh the yoga sutra is about you bringing about your own lordliness and when you achieve that right you're isolated from external influences and that's kaivalya uh 